that he covered in Washington in the midterms uh, with Dan Lopian, who was the White House correspondent for CNN covering Obama, um, and was in Washington for many years, and Cal Borgers, who was a political reporter for the Washington Post, um, covered the 2016 election in the first two years of the Trump administration. Um, Cal is now back in, he's now in Boston, um, uh, working for WBUR, um, but um, his sense of what it was like working in Washington, uh, covering the campaign, covering Trump is, is really interesting. And Dan Lopian, a kind of more seasoned um, journalist, um, can talk about what it was like covering Obama and how that all changed when Trump came into power. So it's going to be a real interesting conversation about the media and uh, Washington, but also uh, looking at what the midterms mean. Um, I'd like to start out uh, to, uh, tonight uh, with two videos to kind of set the table. Uh, one is about the crisis facing print newspapers, um, which Dan Kennedy has written about and, and Ellen Clegg um, has been witness to and been fighting back against it. Um, that's about six minutes, and that'll be followed by a four minute video um, about public media. It's actually a, a, a fellow from Alaska talking about it and strike some of these themes about why public media is important. Um, John Oliver is very funny. Um, some of it's kind of crude, but that's John Oliver, so we should just laugh and enjoy it. Okay, so let me, uh, let me start that. All the president's men, the great not the camper, and most recently, Spotlight. We gotta nail these scumbags, we gotta show people that nobody can get away with this. Not a priest, or a cardinal, or a freaking cop! Now remember, Spotlight actually won Best Picture at the Oscars this year, meaning newspapers finally received the recognition that we normally reserve for subjects of such importance as the incredible bravery of real-life Hollywood filmmakers, the incredible bravery of fictional Hollywood filmmakers, and the incredible bravery of wanting to f*** your daughter's friends. But, but one, of, one of the things that made Spotlight so powerful is the knowledge that the newspaper industry today is in big trouble. Papers have been closing and downsizing for years, and that affects all of us. Even if you only get your news from Facebook, Google, Twitter, or Ariana Huffington's blog book junction and book excerpt clearinghouse, <laughs> those places are often just repackaging the work of newspapers, and it is not just websites. Watch how often TV news ends up citing print sources. According to the Chicago Tribune, according to the Detroit Free Press, according to the San Francisco Chronicle, according to the Tax Picayune, the Boston Globe, the Orlando Sentinel, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Pittsburgh Tribune Review, the Detroit News, and the Houston Chronicle reports, the Los Angeles Times reports, the Los Angeles reports, the Hartford Current reports, the Salt Lake Tribune reports. It's pretty obvious. Without newspapers around to cite, TV news would just be Paul Blitzer endlessly batting a ball of yarn around. <laughs> It is not just news outlets. Stupid shows like ours lean heavily on local papers. In fact, whenever this show is mistakenly called journalism, it is a slap in the face to the actual journalists whose work we rely on. I'll give you just one example. Two years ago, we ran a piece on state lotteries, and a not insignificant portion of it was built on the work of Harry Estep, a reporter at the Oregonian. Uh, here is a clip we used of him talking about this series on camera. Uh, here I am quoting one of his Oregonian stories directly, and here I am doing it again. You probably didn't notice it at the time because you were too fixated on my bold choice of shiny grey tie with checkered dress shirts. <laughs> the tie says Mafia Funeral, the shirt says High School Debate Tournaments, and the face says I am not confident enough to carry this lock off. <laughs> but, but the point is, we used a lot of Harry Isdell's work in that piece, and, and we tried to add new information to our stories, our researchers work incredibly hard, but the media is a food chain which would fall apart without local newspapers. And the problem is, print ads are less popular than, with advertisers than they used to be, and online ads produce much less revenue. I'll show you. Between 2004 and 2014, newspapers gained $2 billion in online Ad revenue. Unfortunately, in that same period, they lost $30 billion in print revenue. So that's like finding a lucky penny on the sidewalk on the same day your bank account is drained by a 16 year old Belgian hacker. <laughs> and this has led to cutbacks in newsrooms. Again, look at the Oregonian. It used to be a big moneymaker. In fact, in 1993, 
the editor talked about how proud he was of its record of success. I've been at that paper more than 40 years, and every year I've been there, uh, I've seen our staff increase, I've seen our salaries increase. Uh, not a year has gone by that an employee at the Oregonian, full time employee, has not been a beneficiary of a raise. Now, that level of confidence is almost tempting fate. It's like a citizen of Pompeii saying, What I love about this city is how volcano proof it is. <laughs> what a year goes by without us not having to have our horrified reactions captured in ash forever. <laughs> Unfortunately, the Oregonian circulation has since dropped, and in 2013, just as Harry Astaire was working on his lottery series, their parent company, Advanced Publications, dropped a bombshell. This picture, tweeted out from inside the Oregonian, shows staffers listening as editor Peter Bonnie wrote the news some had feared. The paper was split in two, stop seven-day-a-week home delivery, and lay off some employees. This is an a strategic move to really focus everybody on what that digital um, future is and what our digital products and services can be. It's true, they became a digital first company. And digital first sounds like a high school euphemism for seductively sucking on a finger. Uh, I put my finger on his mouth, we totally got to digital first. <laughs> it, it was like, ew, but it was also like, oh, And that, that meant big changes. A local weekly, the Willamette's Week, got their hands on a PowerPoint presentation for the Oregonian staff, outlining the fact reporters would be expected to meet a quota of three blog posts a day, and on any post of substance, they would have to post the first comment. And what better way to win the trust of your readers than posting first underneath your own article? <laughs> Those writers were widely criticised and have since been relaxed, but extra digital demands being placed on journalists is now common throughout the industry. Just listen to Washington Post editor Marty Barrett, who you might remember as the guy Leo Schreiber played in Spotlight. Uh, he describes his concerns about the average workload required of journalists. They have to do their traditional reporting, they have to participate in social media, they have to produce a wire service that's available 24 hours a day, they have to be responsible for video, uh, you name it, uh, they're involved, they're involved in it. Uh, it's a lot to ask. That's true, and if journalists are constantly required to write, edit, shoot videos, and tweet, mistakes are going to get made. Perhaps that is how the Boston Globe wound up tweeting following a shooting in Tennessee that the FBI had invested parted about 70 leads. <laughs> Clearly, if they had more time, they would have written hashtag invested parted and <laughs> having to the conversation, hashtag invested parted. <laughs> Um, so that's uh, that's what's going on in a lot of print newsrooms, and then this is a look at uh, some of the issues that are facing uh, public media. All right, urban listener, there's several choices on the radio dial, and NPR is going to be one of them. But uh, here in rural Alaska, lots of rural parts of the country, NPR or travel stations that carry NPR are the only radio station without KYK without public broadcasting here. It would essentially be an information dark zone for households all over this area. Right now in Washington, D.C., there's a bill that would eliminate funding for the corporation for public broadcasting. The CPB receives about $450 million a year from the government and then distributes it to PBS, NPR, and hundreds of local TV and radio stations. On top of that, you've got a president who's put out a budget that also calls for the elimination of public broadcast. Can we really continue to ask a coal miner in West Virginia or a single mom in Detroit to pay for these programs? The answer was no. We can ask them to pay for defense, and we will. But we can't ask them to continue to pay for the corporation for public broadcast. We do have internet, but a lot of times the speeds are slow. We're looking at some of the highest rates in the nation, so not everyone can afford it. But even if everyone could afford to have uh, cable or dish or internet, what they'd be lacking without KYUK is any sort of daily local journalism and information. We live in a census area where Yupik is the main language spoken. So we translate our newscasts in Yupik so that everyone can understand in the language that they understand best what's going on in the world. 
Nathaniel Peter Zak, Jojo Kiwa, Sitharam Kvishmi, Superior Court of Just Kruvo, Makra Gahan. Threats to government funding of uh, public media, it's nothing new. I'm sorry, Chip. I'm going to stop the subsidy to PBS. I'm going to stop other things. I like PBS. I love Big Bird. I actually like you, too. Corporation for Public Broadcasting began in 1967. By 1969, Mr. Rogers was already before the U.S. Senate testifying for them to not cut the funding. The Corporation for Public Broadcasting provides about 60% of our funding. 10% of our funding comes from the state. The other 30% we raise on our own. As a small station operating in an area that's economically impoverished, the economy is not strong. Government funding is vital. If federal funding were cut for the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, there would be information blackouts in parts of the United States because we simply couldn't serve all the areas that we serve now and other, other stations would be in the same boat. I tell everyone that I come across, and I would tell every politician, senator, congressperson, the same thing, that without a fully informed electorate, we're not a strong democracy. And to realize that information is something that they need to prioritize as well, and we can do it relatively inexpensively. A zero funding from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting would be devastating for rural Alaska. Absolutely devastating. <clears throat> Okay, um, part of what's striking is that in Boston, despite all these trends, we probably in Boston, despite all these trends, we have one of the most vibrant news environments in the country. We've got two NPR stations, WGBH and WBUR, and I think Ben will talk a little bit about um, why he fought so hard to uh, create a competitor to WBUR, um, and one in his belief that there was a market for two uh, NPR uh, all-day news shows uh, in town. Um, we have the Boston Globe, which even though it's enduring some cutbacks, as the movie spotlight show, as I think many of us see every day, really puts out uh, one of the best news reports um, every day, uh, and is consistently making full surprises uh, and so forth. We have three uh, commercial broadcast stations that are still um, very vibrant. Um, and there are various nonprofits that are springing up, the uh, England Center for Investigative Reporting and in other areas that are trying um, to kind of fill some of the gap left behind by the, the shrinking of news. <laughs> so why don't you tell Ellen, Ellen, Ben, Ben? Yes, you're going to have to turn those on. Um, uh, Ellen Clegg uh, is somebody I worked with for many years when I was at the Boston Globe. Um, I think she probably held just about every job um, at the Boston Globe at one time or another, but most notably and most recently was the editorial page editor um, for the Boston Globe um, for the last three years before she retired um, a few months ago. And part of what's so interesting about what Ellen did was that you know she took over the Globe editorial page at a time when everyone was trying to figure out how do you reach more audiences. And she really pioneered, and I think many of you will have seen this, um, a much more, um, not only digital strategy, but I think a much more creative and aggressive strategy of packaging editorials, of, of finding ways to kind of make um, the editorial page vibrant. Um, most notably, I think probably the two things that, are, that were most notable um, were the uh, parody page, some of you may remember, that ran uh, before the election, um, which basically talked about Trump being elected and deportation starting. Um, and everyone thought it was a joke until now most of it turned out to be true. At the time, though, um, I think the Globe was criticized by some people who felt that it was kind of going over the edge, and that's something I'd like to talk about. Um, under Alan, the Globe also did um, a, a very famous um, front page editorial. They covered the front page. They didn't interfere with the news content, 
but they put a, a wraparound, which created a front page called Make It Stop, which was about gun violence, um, with very dramatic figures, graphics. One of the graphics showed what a bullet would be like going through the Boston Globe, and again, it got a lot of attention. And um, the Globe has been building on that most recently um, with the campaign it launched um, to get several hundred newspapers around the country um, to sort of defend a free press uh, and to speak out against Trump. They were rewarded with um, a tweet by Trump attacking them. Um, but at the same time, I think there are people who kind of wonder um, how far you move things along in that direction uh, of being an advocate, of putting the editorials forward, um, and what that does to reader trust and so forth. And that's something that uh, I'm sure we'll want to talk to Ellen about. Ben Godley is actually the person responsible um, for the fact that you have uh, all day news and talk on uh, LU, uh, WGBH. Um, when Ben got here, uh, BUR was the NPR station, as he will talk about. Uh, GBH was classical music and jazz in the evening, and he kind of led a strategy that moved classical and jazz to another station and allowed uh, GBH to um, uh, put a tremendous amount of local news uh, on the air at a time when most people were very skeptical about it. It's turned out to be a, a very smart bet. Um, BUR is growing, GPH is growing even faster. I think they double the overall audience for NPR listeners in the area. And um, all around the country, when I talk to people, everyone's trying to figure out how does Boston sustain two competing NPR stations. I think it's a tribute to Boston, but also to a strategy that saw at a time of shrinking newsrooms, you can actually have a strategy that dramatically increases the size of your newsroom. Um, and, and, and make money and, and earn donations while you're doing it. Um, ben is a graduate of the uh, School of Journalism here at Northeastern. Um, he's had a very interesting career. Um, he, uh, as he told the students, much to my dismay, said that after working at the Boston Globe as a co-op uh, and have all sorts of journalism opportunities, decided he wanted to make money. So uh, he went into marketing and public relations, um, worked for Noah Knowlton, worked for IBM, was very successful started his own uh, PR and marketing company here in Boston, um, which was very successful. And then uh, ended up working for Mitt Romney in the State House in a senior capacity when Romney was governor. And then when Romney um, was uh, running for president, was one of his senior advisors and uh, one of his uh, chief fundraisers. So he kind of had a view of the media from inside politics as well as, uh, as, well as his job uh, at WGBH. Um, where he's been, as we in the newsroom used to say, the soup, um, the business guy who basically is in charge of making the station run, um, but making a lot of the strategic decisions um, that shape not just the newsroom, but everything from um, Arthur to Antiques Roadshow to Frontline to American Experience. And GBH is a real powerhouse. And I think one of his goals was, has been, uh, to kind of make that, uh, leverage that more so that more people have access to it. Um, and then finally, Dan Kennedy is a professor of journalism here at Northeastern. He's a longtime media critic. I think we've all felt the sting of his columns at, at various points over the years. Um, he's the author most recently of Return of the Mobiles, um, which is a terrific book that looks at um, especially John Henry at the Boston Globe and um, Jeff Bezos at the Washington Post and what they've done to sort of revive those newspapers, to save those newspapers, and what lessons there may be um, in these new billionaires coming in uh, to journalism uh, and whether that strategy and, and whether they can, uh, they can uh, provide a path going forward. So let's welcome them all and then we'll start our panel. So maybe I could start uh, with each of you maybe talking a little bit about, you know, are you optimists or pessimists right now? in terms of where media is going, both from an economic point of view, but also where it seems like a very polarizing time, um, where the media seems to be under attack, not just economically, but also politically. Uh, Ellen? And also, I, we're, we're, it's wonderful to have Ellen here because, as I think she said to Dan Kennedy, for so many years she wasn't allowed to have a public opinion. <laughs> and now you can. Uh, can you hear me? Um, and please forgive me, I have a strained vocal cord. It's not for yelling at Trump. Thank you. Um, it's, I retired in August. Um, 
After some 37 years at the Globe, I walked into the building in 1978, when I was 27. It occurred to me that I'm no longer 27, and um, it's time for new leadership, particularly as we go into the 2020 uh, electoral campaign, which I believe will start the day after the midterms. Um, so uh, I talked to John and Linda Henry in May and said I'd like to uh, segue out of the globe and do some long-term writing projects. So they have appointed Sherman Lund as an interim uh, editorial page editor. And so I am actually collaborating with Dan on some on a project and doing some other stuff. Uh, forgive me if I say we. I'm curious, do we have any print readers in the room? Oh, wow. That's, that's great. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm optimistic. Uh, it's uh, not journalism being in media, it's uh, not for the same part, but it hasn't been. That's been true since really the year 2000, um, certainly since 2005. Uh, we have the globe has weathered. Uh, Buyouts, layoffs, downsizing, threats uh, uh, to close the paper by the New York Times, a sale to the owner. Um, yep, the globe is still more vibrant than ever. Uh, I would say, and journalism is uh, more vital than ever. It's financially challenged, and uh, we are in an era where we have the burden of print. The whole print production process is very expensive. It's very ancient. Um, it's really a 150-year-old industry. Uh, while we scale up the digital model, and um, we've seen the collapse, the total collapse of um, both digital advertising as well as print advertising, which is dwindling down. The globe just passed a. a Important milestone, it now has 100,000 digital subscribers, and the Globe, like many other newsrooms, including New York Times, Washington Post, believe that subscriptions and are the name of the game going forward. Google and uh, Google and Facebook control about 70% of digital ads in this country. So there's really not much of a digital ad market left for a newspaper like the Globe. Um, print ads, I was remembering I was Sunday editor in the mid-aughts and um, in charge of the Sunday Globe, each classified, page, each page of classified advertising brought in about $60,000. We would have an average of 100 pages in each Sunday paper. And um, in addition to display ads. So that supported the journalism. Has that dwindled? Uh, people have to be nimble, the business side and the editorial side have worked um, more closely than ever on developing apps, events, multiple revenue streams. There are nonprofit models out there like the Texas Tribune that are uh, doing quite well. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I think there have been, there's been storytelling telling and journalism in Boston since the beginning. And um, I think that will continue. Sure. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, it's a mixed uh, review. I'm optimistic. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. So there's really a couple answers there, right? I'm optimistic about um, the importance of journalism, uh, the role it's playing, really preserving a democracy, even though uh, it seems to be under attack. You have 29% of the American public believe that uh, the press is the enemy of the state. Um, but I have hope that the great work of papers like the Post and the Times and the Globe ultimately will prevail. If you just look at the body of work uh, in some of the national papers and trying to keep power in check, I think there's a lot of optimism uh, from the work the Times has done, the work Ellen and other, others have done. Um, there's optimism there because there, there's a craft, there's a, a many generations of uh, 
exceptional journalists who are you know, working incredibly hard to make sure um, that truth to power uh, means something. I'm pessimistic about some of the business models, and it, as we watch the uh, clip on public media uh, from Alaska, uh, you're seeing like in every market this bifurcation of the haves and the have-nots, right? And so the Times and the, and, the, and the Post and the Globe, those are brands, those are organizations that are going to make it. They're going to, they're going to survive. They're going to make the transition from analog dollars to digital dimes. And that's those are really the economics is that Ellen was sharing. I mean, it's it's a completely different model. You have to shed all of the legacy costs and um, change out labor, and you really have to work at it differently. But there are positive signs of that happening. Um, and those organizations are learning how to embrace and use technology. They're understanding how to super serve you as a consumer. Make sure you get the content that you want, when, where, and how you want it, on whatever device you want it on. We've made that transition, so I'm very optimistic, but the, the underlying uh, economics are quite a challenge because you have to go through horrific cuts. In the Herald just announced uh, you know, more layoffs. Um, and the real problem is in those rural markets, and it's not just Alaska. You have many, many communities where the local public radio station or public television station is, in some cases, the only source of news and information. So, um, yes, federal funding is 0.01% of the national budget. It's $1.35 per American um, per year. Um, it's a beautiful public-private partnership where no more than seven, maybe 10% of the average station's revenue actually comes from taxpayer money. But it's critical because what it lets us do is stay focused on what matters. And you know, I've shared this with Jonathan, great journalism really does require philanthropy. And the commercial models are struggling because they have to go and attract readers. Um, and if you don't have the resources, you can't stay disciplined to what truly is news. You end up chasing stories and chasing eyeballs and chasing listeners. And public media, we're in this very unique uh, opportunity where we have tremendous responsibility to go uh, really serve uh, the public and make sure we're working in an unbiased, non-commercial way. And that's why public media has been thriving over the last few years. That's why this market can support two stations. So um, I'm optimistic of public media's role and the numbers in terms of ratings and support is, is uh, proving that out. Uh, but I am worried about markets <coughs> where you don't have scale, you don't have resources, and um, those those organizations, who's keeping that power in check? Who's making sure uh, that the mayor isn't corrupt and that schools, if they're underperforming, somebody's reporting on that? Um, you know, looking at businesses. That's the work of reporters and with tens of thousands of reporters having been let go over the last 10 plus years, we just don't have enough of them. So good reporters, they're concentrated <coughs> in three major markets, New York, LA, Washington. After that, those small mid-market towns, those local communities are really uh, in a bit of a crisis. So I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pessimistic that the resources aren't there at the local level, but I'm optimistic when you do put them, people respond. And I think public media is really an opportunity for us to be uh, that trusted independent voice. Uh, so I'm pretty for our public media. Well, like Ben, I am both optimistic and pessimistic, and on some things I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, I, I think that what makes me optimistic in kind of a cautious way is that we have seen in recent years the rise of some very good, civic-minded, extremely wealthy people step forward to buy some of our great newspapers and to see if they can figure out the business and uh, get them back on a path to sustainability once again. Now, Ben mentioned the Boston Herald. Uh, the Boston Herald is owned by a company called Digital First, and um, it, it was a company that was actually uh, quite innovative and interesting for about 20 minutes, maybe uh, eight years ago. Uh, but it is now controlled entirely by a hedge fund that is trying to bleed its properties dry and take out the last little, little bit of profit. And I'm very pessimistic 
uh, about chains like Digital First, uh, to some extent Gatehouse, which I don't think is, is quite as avaricious as Digital First, but nevertheless operates its papers in largely the same way. Uh, let me give you some numbers. When the globe hit its peak in staffing, which was 15 or 16 years ago, uh, it had around 550 full-time journalists in its newsroom. Today, it's about 220, and it continues to shrink a little bit below that level. Now, in some ways, that's not quite as bad as it sounds because uh, when the globe was at 550, um, it had reporters around the country and around the world. And today, just about all regional newspapers are focusing on local and regional news. Um, but nevertheless, it's quite a, a, a level of shrinkage. Now look at the San Jose Mercury News, um, a great metropolitan daily paper uh, that in many ways was comparable to the globe. Uh, acquired by Digital First, they now have 40 or 50 full-time journalists. And what you're really talking about here is entirely the luck of the draw. Either you get a good owner or a bad owner. And what really worries me is that the public doesn't really get to have a say in that. And habits become so ingrained that getting people to say, well, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna read this local paper anymore because it's just doing such a bad job, that's a hard thing to do. And then there has to be an alternative, and in many cases, uh, there is no alternative. So that makes me kind of pessimistic. I'll give you one more optimistic, pessimistic divide before uh, we move on to the next question. And that is, um, I'm optimistic about the way that a lot of mainstream news organizations have uh, attracted a lot of new interest, new audience, and new money because of the incredible interest in the Trump presidency. Uh, you see digital subscriptions and revenue growing at the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe. Uh, NPR listenership is up. Um, donations to great news organizations like, great nonprofit news organizations like ProPublica are up. Unfortunately, and I haven't seen any data on this, but I think I'm probably safe in saying that virtually all of this increase in interest is coming from an audience that is not, are not fans of President Trump. Um, and the people who do like the president tend to have built their own media ecosystem around things like Fox News and Breitbart. So the polarization that is harming us in so many ways, uh, I think has come to the way we consume media as well. Uh, one last point, I'll end on an optimistic note. Uh, last summer I was giving a talk at the National Press Club uh, and somebody got up and said, I'm a conservative, I hate the New York Times and the Washington Post, I just can't stand them. And I'm thinking, oh God, here it comes, we're gonna get a synopsis of what was on Hannity last night. And no, he didn't. I felt so good about this. He said, every day I read the Wall Street Journal and the Christian Science Monitor. The Monitor is such a great news organization. It's right down the street. Uh, and he said, I feel like they're giving it to me straight in a way that uh, the liberal media uh, aren't doing. And I just felt very good about that, that somebody who does feel disaffected by what he perceives as liberal bias in the media had found a way to seek out high quality news organizations that were also giving it uh, the real journalism. So I'll, I'll end it there and we can figure out what else we want to talk about. Um, so let me ask um, each of you a little bit about kind of these moments where you've tried to maybe battle against what's going on. And Ellen, if you could talk a little bit about, I mean, in my mind, I guess the Trump parody issue was the first time that the Globe tried this new strategy and it's been followed by other things, but that was a pretty gutsy thing to do. And I'm wondering what the, what that moment was like. Uh, it was a moment, definitely. It, we, um, 
we're following this. This was the fake Trump page, and um, uh, it was a satire. We published it on April 9, 2016, when you remember nobody really thought Trump would actually win. Uh, but we were alarmed by his rhetoric and his, um, which even then was uh, about Mexicans being rapists, about the media, the media and um, leading crowds in chance, um, lock her up for Hillary. And so we looked at his policy positions and said, what would it be like if Trump is a man of his word and actually does what he says he's going to do? And so uh, we actually, uh, I have a footnoted version of the page. I read deeply about the economics of deportation, about trade and uh, tariffs, and um, about markets and libel law. And um, we did three versions. It took John, and John Henry gave this his blessing, our, our publisher. Uh, and uh, Brian McGrory said, he said, I'm glad you're doing it, not me. It's on your page. but." Um, so we actually had to do, we did three versions before we felt we had the right tone. Um, the first version was too broad, too broadly satirical, too cartoony. Um, so we abandoned that. Second version was more Orwellian and um, we turned the dial to dark. And it was, looking at it, it was too dark. Uh, so we dialed that back, did a middle ground and took the, it looked like a front page. It was actually the front of the Globe Ideas section. And there was an editor's note at the bottom explaining uh, what we were doing. We um, uh, got an extraordinary um, reaction, I would say. So, Alan, did anybody, when you were proposing this, did anybody say, wait, we're the Boston Globe. We don't do this. This is crossing a line. Uh, Yes, I think uh, a number of people internally, we had a robust debate internally about what it meant for the Globe to do it, what it meant with our relationship of trust with readers, and should we do it? We came down on the side of publishing, but um, we had published, and um, the um, I came in at 6 a.m. the next day to answer phones. We got, I got, we got flooded with angry calls and so, and, and many um, added girls. But uh, then they published my phone number on Fox every hour on the hour. And so I could track the calls that came in by the, um, uh, the area code and the accent. And, uh, I, <laughs> and people would uh, call with a, a deep Southern accent and say, I've been a Globe reader my whole life. And <laughs> Uh, I'm canceling, and uh, and so it. There were unprintable, certainly um, unprintable calls. There were threats. Uh, there were, you know, I'm going to come and teach you uh, uh, John and Linda Henry a lesson. And um, thank goodness we had the guards at the door. Our Morrissey Boulevard office, but. I, I told our customer service uh, department, which feels the reader calls from subscribers, that if anybody really was a subscriber, I would have a conversation with them, uh, whether they were critical or uh, supportive. And I had some of the best conversations I've ever had. Deep, it lasted for a month. I would get these phone calls from customer service. This one is canceling. We lost about. 90 print subscribers, and we gained about 100 digital. So, um, and that's when I knew Trump was likely to win, frankly, because um, Trump got a million votes in Massachusetts, and I talked to a lot of very thoughtful, longtime Globe subscribers who were going to vote for Trump. And when you, when you look at that, I mean, do you think that this I'm not sure if it's a commercial decision or a moral decision that this desire to kind of double down on this kind of um, bell ringing advocacy 
I mean, the, the typical one that I worked at the Globe, I love the Globe, you know, like most editorial pages with all the respect, it was kind of sleepy, right? You know, we support the bottle bill, reasonably people can disagree about this or that. You know, it was kind of down to be sure. Right. And that has <laughs> not been the Globe under you or under Shirley. Um, it's been much more of a service. We, um, and I think, Dan, you've called editorials, um, which is an institutional view at the top of the page, unsigned, musty or fusty, or perhaps bulk. Perhaps bulk. <laughs> and often written by committee, and uh, often not particularly memorable or timely, because um, if you, you may know that editorial boards, I, I had a staff of 14, and that was our editorial board columnists, editorial writers, uh, copy editors, and uh, we all met uh, four times a week. I think Shirley's pro probably following the same cadence. And um, we would deeply debate the issues of the day. So we also are journalists. We get tips. We uh, have um, not beats, but portfolios. I'm a science and tech writer um, myself. And so we, we have conservatives like uh, Shelley Cohen, so the Herald is a, now a contributor to the editorial board, Jeff Jacoby. And we have Ken Benaki, Scott Lehigh, um, a variety of points of view. Linda Henry sits on our board as well. And it's what college campuses would call a safe space. We really debate um, robustly, but respect each other enormously. And um, no ad hominem or ad feminem. Tax, um, and we shape the uh, institutional point of view. I, my goal was to strive for buy-in or consensus. I'm from Minnesota, so it comes naturally to want everyone to get along, and um, and I think we achieved that. But we also wanted to uh, be much more newsy. I come, I was worked in the newsroom for many, many years, and. Brian McGorry had redesigned most of the globe, uh, except for the editorial page. And um, thanks. So I, I wanted to shake it up and let the content dictate the page design rather than the opposite. Uh, so we busted out of the frame. And then we talked about ways to make more of an impact. And the fake Trump page was one. It, the one, the biggest criticism we got was for an item I wrote on um, Madame Ping and Trump starting a trade war with China with a tweet comparing Madame Ping to um, the Sharpay. And that was a just a, a joke, kind of a, a goof item. Although Trump has certainly started many uh, hustles on Twitter. We actually got a, our reporter in China got called to the embassy in Beijing and asked to explain. And then um, I got a visit from the general counsel in New York City, came to Boston to ask for an apology because uh, the satire did not really translate. So are there things I would do differently? I would have put a sash, a red sash at the top. Um, to say more clearly it was a work of satire. Would we do it again? I don't know. Um, as you aptly say, it's a commercial and a moral decision. Okay, um, ben, could you take us back to that moment when, as Dan has described, you know, journalism in the eyes of many of us is sort of collapsing, layoffs are going on everywhere, um, markets are shrinking, ad dollars are shrinking, and you kind of come to town and think, oh, let's like do more news. And again, not necessarily coming from a crusading journalism background, but coming from a political campaign and successful business career. We, uh, at WGBH, we have a 100,000-watt station, 89.7, and 100,000-watt. I'm, I'm sorry, yes. We have a large radio station, 89.7. You can get it in Maine, you can get it in Rhode Island, Connecticut. Um, and when John Abbott was just named, was named CEO at the time, and came in as a COO, we realized we were 26th in the market. We were way behind in terms of ratings behind, and we're just in college, and you know, and it, it, 
we realize that this is not the highest and best use of public resources. It's not serving a large enough audience. And so we made a very hard decision to see if we could take what was what we call a mixed format, where we would do morning edition, which is an NPR service, you know, drive time, and then we do classical music during the day, and we come back to more um, NPR service, with all things considered. And we do some jazz, we have folk, we have, you know, Celtic on the weekends. It was really, uh, I like to call it a fine arts festival, where if you had an idea, you could put on a show, and it didn't matter if anybody listened to it, you could, you could put on a show. But the reality is it was not the highest and best use, and it was not serving the public the way we needed to. So we um, approached our board, and the short of it is we realized we needed to stay in the news and information business. When you really strip back public media, we do a couple of things exceedingly well. We're very good with children's media, and we can talk about that. And we're getting quite good if you look at the whole NPR network, and Dan's correct, it's been thriving over the last few years in particular. The, the Trump bump has benefited many of us. Um, but it's, I'd like to think it's because we are a source of unbiased um, and free of commercial, and we also have um, you know, a rigor and a discipline to stay uh, focused. And when we looked at this market, WBUR, which is a wonderful station, by the way, they were the dominant NPR service, the only NPR service really in all of greater Boston. Why would another NPR station be needed? What was the point? Well, it turns out we were actually doing a lot of things the same. We were both running morning edition. So there was some redundancy anyways, but we realized that if we're going to look at public media, the only way that you can rationalize this national local model is if you have your local stations not just rebroadcasting the NPR service, but focusing on local issues, issues that are important topics to the community, connecting with the community. And that's the only way it makes sense. And so could this market, the question for us is, could this market support a local service? And if you look at the research, the, the number one driver or determinant of whether NPR service will be successful is an education level of its audience. And of course, Boston is one of the smartest cities around, right? And the college education is off the charts. And so we took a gamble that we could, in fact, support too. We did not want to compete or take market share from the UR. In fact, Dan and I were just talking. The last time I saw him, seven or eight years ago, we were on a panel. Uh, I get, you know, as the suit, I get pulled downstairs and said, you need to be on Greater Boston and explain why you're going to compete with BUR. What are you guys thinking? This doesn't make any sense. Is that is that a good use of, of taxpayer money to do the same kind of service? And there was a good, healthy debate on that. And we thought, you know what? What if we grew the pie? What if we actually didn't take market share from BUR, which has not happened. They've, they've grown nicely. And we've grown... Quite, quite nicely. And so we've grown the pie. And what happened was, if you look at you know seven or eight years ago, there was only one hour, one hour of uh, programming focused on this community in from an NPR service. And BUR was doing it. That was it, one hour. Today, there's 32, 35 hours a week. So we've accelerated and invested deeply uh, in our newsroom. We had eight people maybe eight years ago. Today, we have 108. We've added reporters, we've added staff, um, because there's a thirst for informed uh, you know, content, for civil discourse, for you know, information that's helpful for communities, thinking about topics that are relevant to you. We're not going to be in the breaking news as a fire business, right? But if you want thoughtful pieces, that's the space that we think we can, we can play in. And so that was the, the aha moment that we're going to just go for this. And, well, by the way, ask the board of directors for $14 million and, and basically see if this made sense. Um, Dan, could you talk a bit, uh, do your Jeff Bezos invitation, um, and talk about kind of that moment and what Bezos has meant for the Post and um, you know what it may mean for journalism in general? Okay, great. Uh, before I answer that question, is there anyone in charge of irrigating the panelists? I'm so dry, I can hardly talk. Um, and I'll just put that out there. Uh, okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, when Jeff Bezos 
bought the Washington Post from the legendary Graham family. The Post was profitable. Don Graham, the uh, last of the Graham family owners, uh, said, we're making a profit, but the way we've been able to be profitable is that we cut every year. And I'd like to turn the paper over to somebody who might be able to make the sort of investments that the Post can be profitable and grow every year. And uh, I, I would note that when Jeff Bezos bought the Post, uh, the Post had a newsroom of about 560 people, full-timers. Today, it's approaching 800. Now, you might think that being the richest man in the world uh, has a lot to do with that. Uh, it doesn't hurt, but it has less to do with the Post success than you might think. For instance, the New York Times still has about 1,300 full-time journalists. And if Bezos just wanted to run this as a vanity project, he could have said, well, we're going to have 1,500. What do you think of that? And he hasn't done that. He's operated it as a real business. Probably the most important thing he's done, and unfortunately, you're hoping that this is going to lead to lessons. And the post is so unique that it's hard to draw much in the way of lessons from it. Probably the most important thing he did was he resolved a debate that had been taking place at the Post forever. Are we a large local newspaper that happens to be in the nation's capital, or are we national? And Bezos came in and he said, we're national. We're digital, but we're national. We'll still put out a print edition for the local audience, but we're going to go for that big national audience and compete head-to-head -head with the New York Times. Now, that's important because the worst place to be in in the newspaper business at the moment is owning a large regional newspaper. Just ask John Henry. It's a very, very difficult task. But Bezos sensed that there was still a little bit of room at the top, and he took full advantage of that. Um, he's leveraged the post in some very interesting ways with Amazon, which is another lesson that other newspaper owners can't really take much away from. If you buy a Kindle Fire, the Post app is pre-installed. If you're a member of Amazon Prime, you get the Post at a huge discount. Uh, as a result, he's been able to build a huge national audience and convert some of the drive-by traffic that you get into paying digital subscribers. Uh, thank you so much, John. Um, the, the, the last time the Post reported numbers, and they don't report them very regularly, it's a privately held company and they hold their numbers very close to the desk. Uh, but the, uh, the, the Post had reached over a million paid digital subscribers. Uh, the New York Times is at about three million, but, but the Post you see is catching up. Um, the Post has reported profitability each of the last two years. And this is all the, all the time that it is growing. So uh, to earn profits and grow in this environment is really quite an accomplishment. Now, I can think of two takeaways that other newspaper owners ought to keep in mind, uh, because I don't want to make it sound like Bezos is completely out there on his own. One is that <clears throat> You have to maintain quality if you want to turn your readers into paying customers. People are not going to pay more for less. Uh, they're just not going to do it. And I think that what you see with John Henry at the Globe is that even though he's done a little cutting here and there, he's worked very hard at maintaining the quality of the Globe. Uh, just this morning, uh, the Globe announced that they had hired a new art critic to replace uh, Sebastian Smee, who was a Pulitzer winner who went to the Washington Post about a year ago. Uh, this was kind of a big move. That was just one person, but an art critic is the sort of position that a lot of newspaper owners these days would say, hey, yeah, we don't need an art critic. But the Globe has made the commitment to keep that uh, as they pursue their, their strategy of selling digital subscriptions. So that's one takeaway from Bezos. I think the other takeaway, and I wish more newspaper owners took this more seriously than they did, including John Henry, 
And that is, if you're going to bet the farm on digital subscriptions, your technology has to be great. Um, the Post's digital products, mobile, tablet, web, are just a pleasure to use. So are the New York Times, is, although they take a, a different approach to these things. Um, the Globe, it's kind of frustrating. It's probably better than almost everybody else, but it's still not as good as it ought to be. Now this fall, the Globe is making a transition to the ARC content management system, which is licensed from the Washington Post. They've already rolled out a new mobile app based on ARC technology. It's not as good as what the Post offers, but it's an improvement. But I do think that Bezos's insistence on technological excellence is something that newspaper owners have to pay attention to if they're going to get readers to uh, shell out money for digital subscriptions. Okay, let me do one more round of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. Um, Ellen, you've probably spent more time, I think, of all the journalists at the Globe with John and Henry than maybe anybody else. Um, and I want you to talk a little bit, acknowledging this is live streamed, um, you know, about what they're like, what the dynamic is, um, and, and kind of, you know, very often publishers or the suits are kind of out of, you know, out of the limelight, and yet they clearly are crucial to what the future of the globe is. You give us some insight into them individually and as a couple. Um, well, it's, um, <clears throat> I'm, I have, uh, I'm a big fan of both of them. It, I didn't know what to expect when I took uh, the editorial page out of your job. And, um, but John is a, uh, not from here as they say, but he's a citizen of Boston. He believes, he and Linda both believe in Boston. They um, think it's a special place uh, that uh, has a, a vision for the future. And their vision for the globe is, um, you may have known Tom Winship. Um, John Henry and Tom Winship, the legendary editor of the Globe, are not they're all alike, but they have a similar soaring vision for what uh, a news outlet should do um, and be for a city. Um, John has a, I reported directly to John, who's my direct boss, and he um, runs a number of businesses and so he's often not in the building, but he's a big phone texter and phone caller. And um, he himself is a very good writer and very good editor, I would say. Would he um, um, would occasionally call him. I, so he, I should back up here and say the process works that uh, he said, he and Linda both said, you don't have to see every editorial. We trust the board process, and we like the board process. We respect it, but please, no surprises. They said, if you're going to call for an end to baseball in Boston, let us know. And uh, um, so I used my gut. I used my gut to um, determine what I thought they should see. If I thought they were going to hear about it from the mayor or the governor, the next day I'd, I'd show them the editorial. Um, and um, Linda sits uh, on the board uh, in a big Monday meeting is, is when all hands are on deck, including if the Globe has three contributing editorial board members, Shelley Cohen from the Herald, Diane Hessen, who's an entrepreneur, and um, Robin Washington, ex of the Boston Herald, who's a transportation expert. Um, so Linda sits in and people go around the room and pitch ideas and talk about them. And um, Linda's a smart, sharp observer of Boston. She is um, involved very deeply in the sort of tech and innovation community and the startup community. So she brings a perspective of that, of that knowledge economy that we don't always see um, at the globe. Um, so our relationship was uh, one of trust and mutual respect. Um, ben, could you talk a little bit about technology? 
uh, one of the things when we were meeting with students that was interesting is at the end, you at least creeped me out, maybe the students aren't as creeped out, with you know this idea that NBR now has the capability through various apps to track what you watch, what you listen to in the car, and then personalize that. You ask permission, but you know, then you can personalize it. But if you could talk about, in a sense, technology and how that's changing the radio experience and what you're responding to. Sure, it's just to be clear on that, it's actually the, the PBS one as well. But I, I will, you know, the only way any of these organizations survive, public media, post, globe, is with technology. We all agree, we all understand, the print world is going away. It's just a question of when, but it's going away. And technology will drive um, sustainability if used the right way. And the, I've seen, uh, probably not as much as Dan has, but I've seen the workings and the strategies and the technology at the Washington Post, and it is world class. They are way out in front of everybody else. Um, so here we are, little WGBH in public media land, and we, for the first time, built a um, system. We work with PBS. So if any of you are familiar with a service called Passport, that is basically the Netflix version uh, uh, for public media, for public television. So if you love Downton Abbey or uh, documentaries by Ken Burns, and Eric Experience, or Frontline, um, what happens is a lot of those program rights go away after a certain number of uses. And so we've kind of put a lot of that behind the wall as a thank you for and a member benefit for donors to their local station. And so this passport service is available if you uh, are a donor. And it's whether it's $60 or $600, if you're donating, you get access to it. So out of 3 million donors to public television in the whole system, more than a million people have activated this service. And, and it's great. Um, we ask for permission to say, do we have the right to take your viewing habits when you log in and register and share that with the local station? This is something we work very closely and debated with PBS on this right. Um, and they eventually said, yes, let's, we'll build it this way. So we built it that way. And now we have all of this viewing data in a database and we can connect that to giving data. Why does that matter? Well, if I'm prospecting and going after major donors, and I know that you love Downton Abbey, we're going to have a very different conversation than if I know your kids are watching Arthur or not, right? And so it gives, lets us segment and personalize. And the short of it is, the only stations or the only newspapers who are going to make it are those who understand how to super serve audiences. And so we spent a fair amount of money building this technology, connecting it. So when we send you an email link and you click on it, because we know you love NOVA, when you go to the WGBH.org site, you will pull up three or four NOVA recommendations. It's called a recommendation engine, and we felt very good about ourselves. We're the only ones in public media that have this, but Netflix has had it for 15 years, right? So we are way behind, and most newspapers are way behind. Um, certainly any other uh, local radio stations are not in this business, but if we don't understand how to super serve, there are so many choices. We're in the golden age of television, right? So if you're in PBS content, you can go to Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, any of these over-the-top services. All these people are cutting cords because they can go get what they want at their convenience on the device they want, whatever they want. And so for public media to survive, we've had no choice but to then know what you want, super serve you, but never lose the serendipity that comes with, oh, that's a really cool program. And so there are algorithms, it's all math, to figure out what should we present to you? What are the models of the next offering to you? And so the organizations that will win, I think, will figure out how to exploit that technology, whether they build it themselves or they license it from the Washington Post. That's the game that everybody's in today because uh, otherwise this gap of haves and have nots will continue to grow. Okay, so Zach has put on his sneakers, um, and he's now ready to um, uh, uh, be the ringmaster for your questions. So catch his eye, wave. So this is um, not necessarily a question, but a challenge. Um, I think one of the things that 
I feel as a Boston area listener viewer is that we're not hearing enough from the western part of Massachusetts, and I'm saying, you know, west of Worcester. And I would challenge WGBH to put on the radio at least an hour of a talk show like Jim and Marjorie, but with a host from Western Massachusetts, because I think we're not getting the whole picture and we're poorer for that. And I think that if we have a million voters for Trump, I would imagine a lot of them are from Western Massachusetts. And I think that we need to understand each other better. Thank you for that question and that challenge, and you're absolutely right. One of the things I failed to explain is that we have a station in Springfield, WGBY, and a small but important move was to move them into a nightly news and information show, just like Greater Boston. So they don't have the economics to support that. That's WGBH using money to build that program. Uh, and we are working in partnership with New England Public Radio out there. We built a Dorchester Bureau, which no other newspaper has. We built a library studio, and we do a lot of work there. We cover the state house. Uh, we have a Cape and Island station down in Falmouth. Um, but we are going to do more in Springfield, and you're absolutely right. To build a statewide network and cover topics uh, that are important to families on a range of issues, uh, we do see that as a responsibility, and it's something we've been working on. I should say the same is true of the globe. Um, we uh, one of the, one thing that I wanted to try that I never did uh, was to get the board uh, out of the building and um, uh, and and roam around the state a little bit and have sort of open influence. But unfortunately, the Globe was always a New England-wide newspaper, and the business challenges that face all newspapers have forced the Globe to essentially just serve Eastern Massachusetts at this point, and not much beyond that. Uh, and that's happened at the same time that the newspapers that were serving these other areas of New England have also shrunk. Uh, I wonder if it might be possible now that distributing the print newspaper all over New England is less important than it used to be, uh, whether the Globe might consider uh, expanding its coverage into more parts of New England since most people are signing up for it digitally. Let me ask you, let me ask you, Dan, because this is something you wrote about in your previous book, um, looking at New England, when you wrote about civic media, the rise of civic media. The Globe is kind of robust enough that it's doing you know, a good job, maybe not a perfect one, but the disappearance of local newspapers has been a real problem. Um, there are signs of other way of Vermont bigger and other places like that. I mean, what's your sense of that? Whether can they fill um, that hole of coverage throughout the world? I think that when there is a gap, you will often see people stepping forward to try to fill that gap. Now, there's nothing systematic about it, and you're really dependent on the right people being in the right place at the right time, um, and, and, and that's really more than it should be. There has been some talk about various ways of having off-the-shelf solutions to um, launching local news sites, but you still need the people to do it. Uh, probably the best example, and what, what Jonathan's referring to in my previous book, uh, The Wired City, is uh, New Haven, Connecticut, um, which uh, is the home of a absolutely amazing online-only nonprofit news project called the New Haven Independent. It was founded in 2005. Uh, 2005, yes. Today, it's stronger than ever. They've actually added a community radio station of what they do. And they just cover everything that moves in New Haven with a very small staff. And in large measure, they were responding to the decline of the um, larger regional daily newspaper in that uh, area, the New Haven Register, which um, was owned by Digital First. Uh, did, actually, the New Haven, it, it's more to get into than I want, but 
the New Haven Register was ground zero for digital first, back when it meant something, and we thought digital first was going to do something interesting. But then the decline started to set in. So here you have a fantastic uh, example of uh, local community people responding to the, the failure of market journalism, essentially. But there's a reason that the New Haven Independent is one of the probably five or ten best known of such projects in the country. And that is, you really need visionary leadership at the local level to make it happen. And, and they had that in the person of Paul Bass, who had been a New Haven journalist for a long time, who also knows how to raise money. Um, Jonathan mentioned Burlington, Vermont, where uh, there's been a lot of interesting stuff that's risen up to fill in the gap uh, left by the decline of the local daily. And you can certainly point to a number of places here and there where people are actually being very well served by some of these newer forms of local media. But then you also look at plenty of other places where you don't have that kind of visionary leadership and uh, there's a real void that hasn't been filled. Could I ask you to comment about uh, the local TV news departments? Do they have similar challenges? Yeah, that is a real challenge. As you can imagine, the cost of producing television is exponential compared to radio. Um, and, you know, you have to work. We're in a multi-format, multi-platform world. And we at WGBH certainly have extensive digital applications and services. We have radio stations. And we try to provide synergy where we can. Certainly Jim Browdy and what he covers every night is often fed through the newsroom that's broadcasting news throughout the day that may be also a topic that they covered on Jim and Marjorie's show, right, in Boston Public Radio. So we try to find those synergies to keep the cost down, but it's almost impossible um, to, without philanthropy, and again, that's the secret sauce for public media to make it, uh, without that support, there's no way the economics work to attract enough local eyeballs to sell the advertising um, and the, to cover the costs needed to produce real news, right? Um, and so it, it's it's a crisis, it's, it's a shame. There are um, pockets of digital first uh, organizations who are making a difference and, and pulling stuff together. We're still in that transition. Um, the big broadcasters, uh, they've sort of lost that issue watch the networks today, um, it's really not news, right? You're covering fires and sports, and they don't have the reporters. That's the, the message I want to get through, um, that we need more reporters. With the time, they have to be paid well, they have to have the time to do the important work in the local communities and at the national level too. But the national folks are getting those resources. The models are working, but at the local level, it's a crisis, and local television uh, is really uh, in trouble as a news outlet. If you don't have a network to leverage in you know, a local national model, it's impossible. And public television continues to work on that. You do it on radio quite well in the NPR services, sharing stories back and forth. But you know, you don't see many segments from WGBH on PBS News Hour. Um, but broadcasting is a very different economic model and it's going to continue to struggle. I have a comment as well as two questions. Um, the Globe, um, thank you for what you've done for the print Globe because it's still very important to a lot of people. You can't break a newspaper. There's so many things you can do with a print newspaper that you can't do with the digital version. Um, my question, one of my, my first question is, why do you care or do you care that there's criticism of the media? Because it seems to me that it isn't something that affects the success and, um, and as long as you have thick enough skin, do you really care if the president criticizes you? Uh, as long as he calls upon you, I guess, at a press conference. But um, my next question is, why can't media follow the model of the movie business, which was supposed to die about 20 years ago with the advent of videotapes? And they didn't make better movies. They just made themselves, well, the medium is the message. 
they made themselves important that going out to a movie is different from watching it in your home. And why can't you know the why can't journalism follow that model or something similar to keep itself alive? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I think the movie analogy is is apt in a way because it's about storytelling and narrative and something that's very compelling and you have to see it and you have to read it. And I think that's why um, the Globe has added to its spotlight team, it's added to its narrative team, it's experimenting with long form narratives. Uh, that sing and dance, you know, podcasts and videos, and um, in in an effort to give people a, an essential multimedia experience. Why do I care that Trump, or why should journalists care that um, Trump uh, re criticizes the media, uh, says we're the enemy of the people? Because it's uh, the first, it's often history teaches us that that's really the first uh, go-to move for an autocratic leader. And um, the uh, Thomas Jefferson famously said that uh, if he had a choice between democracy and free press, he would pick um, free press. However, he later, after he served as president and was criticized, he took that back. But it's um, there's concern that um, Trump, you know, these rallies that uh, reporters attend, campaign rallies where they need police protection because um, people want to trip them or throw things at them. Um, I've certainly, you know, the Globe received uh, death threats uh, from this man who has since been indicted after the free press collaboration uh, he made 14 calls to the newsroom, and I can't repeat the language he used, but um, he said he was going to come at 4 o'clock and shoot people in the head. So suddenly we had uh, police, uh, great, great protection from the Boston police and from the uh, Joint Terrorism Task Force, uh, but it's, it's serious business. Um, let me just though, pick up on that, and, and, and you know, there are those who would say, looking at this panel, okay, liberal Boston Globe, liberal NPR, liberal college professors. I mean, is that a problem for us? Um, you know, that that we should be worried about. I'm going to defend the liberal label, not that there's anything wrong with it, but the reality and Frontline, which is a crown jewel of WGBH, uh, we did uh, an analysis of our viewers and. It was basically a third, a third, and a third, with slightly more people identifying with the conservative political outlook. That's from um, we We must remain fair. Uh, you and I have talked about balance. Balance isn't always achievable, nor should it be, because if you have someone with a more high ground than an issue and an absolute extreme position, you're not going to give equal weight to one extreme over the other. So it's relative. But fairness is key. And the business that we're in is trust. We lose trust, we're out of business, right? That's the currency that we trade in. So what are we doing about it? Well, it's all the journalism ethics of you know, sourcing. We've gone as far as describing on the air who edited that segment, who, who's responsible, not just the reporters involved, but who are the editors. And Frontline, for example, just launched a transparency project where we will show you the outtakes it went into that film. So if there's an interview, we only used a few clips, go watch the other 20 minutes and make it easy to search, easy to navigate. Those are the steps we're going to to make sure we're transparent and you can understand who's behind these stories. We can never be in a position of, of being biased in anything we do. Um, it is a problem if in fact the, the press is discredited to the point where they no longer become an important vehicle for searching for truth and hold, holding power uh, accountable. If, if more people tune out, which is a frightening statistic, um, we lose uh, control in a lot of areas. We've seen some of that. It's critical that people respect. We keep journalists safe. We've had our own issues at WGBH. I know the Globe has as well. 
Um, it's really hard to be, if you're a foreign correspondent or you're covering, uh, you know, incendiary topics, um, you know, what happened in Charlottesville, those are really hot issues. Um, journalists have to, they're not trained for that, right? But they're, we've got to create a safe environment where civic and civil discourse is the norm. And, um, you know, that's inclusion, that's more voices. Um, I'm optimistic there are pockets of it, but it's just not enough. Um, a couple of things. First of all, I'd like to return to the question about why do people in the media care uh, whether President Trump and his supporters uh, detest us or not. You know, I think that what it comes down to is we want to have impact when we do important work. And we are in such a polarized moment that we can do incredibly important work that resonates with the people who are already trusting what we do, and yet it has no broader impact at all. Um, last week, as you probably know, the New York Times published a 14,000 word uh, investigative report on uh, the Trump family's uh, tax avoidance um, strategies over the years uh, that raised the possibility of wrongdoing on the part of President Trump and his siblings. It was one of the most shared stories in the history of the New York Times. They printed it twice um, in, in print, and yet it's had no broader impact whatsoever. Now, this isn't about, oh, we want to bring down a president and we're failing to do that. That's not what it's about at all. It's about doing really important work and not being able to break out of the community that you already have built around your journalism and break into other communities. And, and that's just, it's just frustrating, quite frankly. Uh, the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is the idea of do people trust the media? Um, you've all seen the studies that show distrust of the media has gone up, up, up. Uh, not fake news, but one of the most widely misunderstood um, phenomena of our time. Um, it is almost entirely an artifact of the explosion of media outlets, each catering to its own niche. If you ask people, do you trust the media? They're going to say, no, I don't like the media. Um, it's an obvious thing to say. But then you say, OK, what news sources do you use on a regular basis? And they might say, well, I read the Globe, I listen to WGBH, of course, uh, and then uh, I, I try to keep up on the New York Times as much as I can. Well, do you trust them? I say, well, sure, why would I waste my time if I, if, with, with them if I didn't trust them? And you could do the same thing with uh, conservatives. You say, do you trust well, I'll go back to my earlier example. Do you trust the Wall Street Journal and the Christian Science Monitor? Sure, of course I do, but I can't stand the media. So, I mean, it's a way of thinking about trust that I think is a little bit more granular than just saying people hate the media. Question for the Globe. Could you describe the op-ed process at the Globe? Uh, for example, if I were a citizen who disagreed uh, with an editorial piece at the Globe, and I wrote a long analytical opposing letter, uh, essay, uh, what would happen next? Let's assume I'm uh, an unknown uh, citizen, not a professor at a major local university or otherwise. What would happen next? Would the Globe be in touch with me? Would we have Discussion. Um, what would be the process? That, that's a great question, and I'm glad you brought up op ed. Um, I, this, the question of fairness has come up, and the op ed pages are incredibly important. We want intellectual diversity, we want response, we want to curate a smart conversation. And um, there are two ways to be heard as a uh, as, as a citizen, as a non-professor or non-journalist. Um, one is a letter to the editor. There's not much space. 
So those are limited to 200 words. The op-ed, there's a, a address, an email address you can send um, uh, an op-ed piece that you write. It should be about 600 to 800 words um, and responsive. Uh, it should be about an issue of the day. It can be a response to the editorial, but it should be more than just a direct response. It should offer the reader um, a different opinion. And um, you send it into the email address. And then um, if you don't hear anything for within a week, you could email Marjorie Pritchard, the op-ed page editor, and uh, directly. Email, we uh, live and die by email in, in the globe. We scroll, we're always on our phones, so that's more effective than calling, actually. So, and then um, Marjorie and, or I, uh, or Dante Ramos of the Ideas page editor, certainly would be willing to work with writers if we, on, on look style, on um, getting the piece ready for publication. Uh, if we think it's uh, a, a, a good piece. So we welcome that. Um, and I would invite everybody to uh, submit because your view is important. This conversation, that's, that's vital to democracy. One thing that's interesting that I have to say I didn't even think about until one of our students brought it up is that in a similar situation, you can call GBH during Jim and Marjorie's show. You can call BUR. I don't put you on the air. You can call sports radio these days and talk about Trump. So it is interesting the way in which radio has become a more interactive medium. You know, TV was always very passive. You sat there and watched it. Radio was very passive. You sat there and listened. But as we all kind of struggle to figure out where's the common ground and where do people have conversations, and that's one thing I think in the way Boston has been very successful at, whether it was on point with Tom Ashbrook, whether it's Jim and Marjorie, whether the other shows that VUR is doing, I think there has been an interesting way. And even sports radio, which maybe I, some of us wish would have more sports, is becoming a place where these conversations are, are taking place. I don't know if that's something you consciously thought of as, as kind of a, a goal you were trying to push. Well, we have a responsibility to engage, right? And it's certainly come down to the Boston Public Library and actually sit and watch Jim and Marjorie's show. Um, and, you know, we, we brought them in. It was a bit of a gamble. People said, this is an NPR, right? This is a, this is, this is a conversation. Um, but that's, we need to engage more. We need, to Ellen's point, we need to hear opinions. We need more opinions and different opinions. We get caught up in this echo chamber on the left or the right, and that's not the business that we're in. Um, they're in those businesses because they have to find a large addressable market. Their business model requires them to reach people consistently. If we have support really at the thoughtful, intelligent, civil level, it can come from the left, the middle, and the right, and that's the space that we're trying to play in. So, it's important we don't get labeled, and it's important we work hard to engage. And it's certainly on the radio, but online, and um, in the community. We've, we have 20-some thousand people come through WGBH Studios with events. And I know the Globe has done and used this strategy as well to really look to events, to bring people in, to connect them more. There's Globe Docs, Hub Week, all the stuff that Linda's been driving to, again, increase engagement. If your experience is just passively watching a TV show once in a while, that's not a relationship. We need to move from this transactional to relational, and that only comes with lots of different touch points, coming in and meeting us, getting us on the phone, sending us a letter, emailing us, um, et cetera. So all of the media uh, outlets are looking to increase engagement if they have the resources, if they can do that. Um, and that's certainly something we're focused on. Um, uh, ben, you uh, you said, and I agree that trust is hu hugely important. Um, I lost a lot of trust in NPR. Hard to get it back. The day after Charlottesville, and uh, Trump did his press conference, which was very well covered, and a lot of us listened to it. And then I listened to NPR's morning edition and the coverage of it, and. 
Hitler was just blown away by what they excluded from what he said, obviously to make him look much worse than he is. Um, and it just, you know, I just wasn't expecting it from NPR. I expected from the from the other folks, but again, it just blew me away, quite frankly. And it's again, I, I I'm not sure I trust NPR anymore. Well, I don't know the piece, and I will only say that NPR, as you know, is a national service, and we, just like WBUR, will run many of the national programs and the services intact, but we're working hard locally to localize that and tell it from a different perspective. Uh, and if you know it was GBH, we want to make sure that we've got all that covered. Our editors are listening and making sure that we're painting a complete picture. I can't speak to that one issue, um, look, no organization is infallible. I do know that the rigor of NPR in, uh, you know, is among the highest standards of, of any organization uh, in terms of being fair. Uh, but I can't speak to that one issue. But, you know, people will find, uh, you know, a connection and a relationship with the outlet they feel most comfortable with. And, um, I think NPR would want to win your trust back. I know WGBH or BUR certainly does. All right, I think we can probably have one more question and then we can wrap it up. Any of the students? Oh, yeah, okay. Go ahead. The, uh, the um, pay scheme has changed over years. There was times when it was free and then there was the pay wall. And I'm paying for the times now. Of my mother shaving, she's one print to continue on. But with all these competing, and I want to stay um, buried in my new sources, but there's so many. If I were honest, I'd subscribe to six or seven, but I don't. So uh, how do I make a decision, or how do you realize that are there different ways of how much I use, like 20% usage, or does it have to be 100% usage? Are there other ways? So, the Washington Post, in particular, New York Times, they're very good at understanding how many should I give you for free? And then, how long should your trial period be? And then, you know, when I renew you, at what level? Again, that's all math and testing and testing and testing. Um, the reality is, the print versions, in many cases, Ellen will know this, Dan, better than I, they're still the economic engines to making this digital thing work. There's no return on investment. If you said, I'm just going to get out of the print business altogether and just be an online newspaper. So while it is expensive, it's an incredible bargain for what you're getting given the work that's needed. Um, so I would say subscribe to as many as you can and you can afford. Um, but they'll, they'll get better and better at, uh, it won't, I don't think it'll get to just pay for what you consume. You see that in the television medium with, I can download or rent a movie for two or three bucks or five bucks or whatever. Um, you don't quite have that choice yet in journalism. I'm not saying it'll get there. It doesn't seem right because what you really need is a consistent cash flow. Uh, in public television, public radio, we have a thing called sustainers. That's the lifeblood of making sure that we can build the resources needed to go do the reporting, to go do the work, to build, you know, create the films and the content that you love. If we didn't have sustainers, so your subscription model is no different than what we do in public media. We were doing it for 60 years. It's just voluntary. Um, and I think one of the challenges that media is facing is, you know, you would never go into a restaurant and say, that was a great meal, and then just walk out, right? I and mean, you're expected to pay for it. And, um, and I think, you know, when Spotlight came out and the reporters, the real reporters of Spotlight, uh, we're being lionized and all this stuff. Sasha Pfeiffer would always end every one of these panel discussions by saying news isn't free. And, and But I think one of the challenges, I think, for the students here, this is something that, that the millennial generation, you know, I think is grappling with but may end up paying a price for. There is a belief that we are, in fact, in a golden period now where the legacy news organizations are still producing enormous amounts of content. Um, and the digital organizations are putting it out there. There's a danger though, that unless a lot of billionaires come around or there's a new model, that that could disappear. And what you're seeing on the local level, where you know 
There used to be 14 people covering the state house in Boston, and now there are maybe two or three. You know, you're seeing that happen, and that's kind of the canary in the coal mine. So that it's sort of like climate change. People don't want to act in a way that will really change things and change the narrative. So, I mean, as a guideline, you know, we make our students and most of our journalism courses subscribe to the Globe, the Post, and the Times. It's kind of a robust uh, news diet. Um, you know, we encourage people to contribute something to the NPR if they're listening. And then there are always a couple of things, whether it's the Athletic or the Ringer or the Atlantic or the Economist. You know, we all have things that we like to read. Altogether, that's not a lot of money. You know, it's probably, you know, one flight to visit your kids or your nephews or, you know, as, as NPR always says, it's Starbucks coffee uh, every day. But people have to somehow feel not only that it's worthwhile, but they're being shortchanged when they don't get it. And I think one of the big changes I've noticed is when I was growing up in New York, there was this sense that you couldn't go outside at the beginning of the day without having read the New York Times or read the paper. It was part of being an informed citizen. And I think that's part of what we almost have to, you know, there's more of a burden on the consumer of the news. You know, it's up to you to make the choices. We can't force you, we'd love to, but we can't force you to buy it. <coughs> And um, somehow people have to say, no, this is important to me, and I'll spend, you know, 10 bucks a week to sort of be an informed citizen. Um, but that's a, a different transaction than it used to be, where we could just broadcast the stuff to you, and people felt obligated to take it. You won't respond. Um, I, I think it's a lot of money. I think it's a heck of a lot of money. Um, I think that. If you were going to limit your news diet, as we probably did a generation ago, to getting one paper delivered to your house, um, if you were to get a subscription to the Globe or the Times or the Post, that wouldn't really be so bad. But in the long era of free online news, I think we all became accustomed to regularly checking in with four, five, six uh, news sites on a, on a on a weekly basis at least, if not a daily basis. And to pay for all those things is, is very expensive. The other thing I would point out is when the Globe was delivered to your doorstep every morning, um, you were not paying for broadband to come into your house. You weren't paying for cell service. You weren't paying for all your digital devices. And although I think slowly the public is coming to understand that it doesn't work this way. I totally am sympathetic with the idea that if I'm paying all this money, gee, the content ought to be free. And it's, it's a great idea uh, because you are paying a lot of money. It just doesn't work that way. So I think that when we ask our audience to pay for what uh, we're providing, we really have to be humble about it and understand that we're asking for Okay, well, humbly, thank you very much for coming tonight. Uh, great panelists.